Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live today. We have quite the international audience filling up right now as more of you join our Facebook Live. Um, we chose this time zone today since our guest is going to be tuning in from the Sunshine Coast, Queensland, Australia. So uh, we hope to see a lot of Australians in the crowd, but really we're, we're excited to see our viewers from all over the world. So thank you so much to all of you for joining. Uh, so lovely to see you all here today. Uh, we have a great session lined up for you today. Before we get to it, I'll just let you know about a MyHeritage DNA sale that we have going on at MyHeritage, a fantastic deal for you to take advantage of to purchase DNA kits for yourself, for your family members. I will be putting a link in the comment section to the sale so that you can take advantage of the fantastic sale today. Uh, and so make sure to check that out. Um, in addition, we'll be doing a draw for today's session. We'll be giving away a MyHeritage Complete Plan at the end of today's uh, Facebook Live. So in order to join, um, please let us know what feature you enjoy most using on MyHeritage, what tool, what feature, uh, what section of MyHeritage you enjoy the most, and why. So just put that in the comments section, and we'll be choosing one lucky winner uh, who will win a MyHeritage Complete Plan. So for those of you who don't know yet, the MyHeritage Complete Plan is the best plan that we have to offer at MyHeritage. It includes unlimited access to 14 billion historical records, unlimited family tree size, uh, unlimited access to all of our photo tools. So that's MyHeritage in color, the MyHeritage Photo Enhancer, uh, MyHeritage Photo Repair, uh, Deep Nostalgia, which is our uh, animation tool, which went viral earlier this year. So all in all, the MyHeritage Complete Plan is just a fantastic gift for one lucky viewer. And we'll be giving that away at the end of today's session after the questions. Of course, as with all of our Facebook Lives, we uh, do a question session at the end. So make sure to put them in the comment section. Whenever they come up, you know, if you have a comment at any point in time, just type it into the comment section. And we hope that we will have a chance to get to it today uh, and answer it. So I'd like to introduce our speaker we have with us today, Fran Keto. And as I said, she's joining us from Australia. She came to family history later in life. It happened when looking for a new interest that combined her interests of traveling, blogging, and technology. She is a regular Roots Tech ambassador, webmaster, and social media guru for um, the Kalundra family history. And she's also a host for ANZ Ancestry Time, Tuesday nights at 7.30 p.m. AEST on Twitter. Other interests include sport and crocheting. By day and most nights, she works in the family importing business, the wallpaper people, to help fund her family history adventures. Um, and now um, I'm going to bring her on so she can tell us all why spreadsheets. Uh, she'll be speaking today about using spreadsheets to make the most of my heritage. So let's ask Fran herself, why spreadsheets, Fran? <laughs> um, because I get addicted to things like family history conferences and spreadsheets I've used for years and years because you can just manipulate them and I like manipulating things. <laughs> so I just love it. I just don't know you know how you love somebody but you don't really know why <laughs> amazing well we're so glad to have you here today thank you so much for joining us that's all right you're quite welcome I see there's a lot of people including some of my um, ANZ ancestry time Twitter mates and other friends from Aussie so it's really great that they joined us and all these other people around the world and obviously some people English is not their first language but so thank you to them for turning up. And uh, just before we start, I love to remind everyone that uh, if you miss any part of today's session, you can always re-watch it on the MyHeritage Facebook page under the video section. It'll be available there as well as all of our past Facebook Lives. So um, make sure to, to re-watch it, this one or any of our past sessions. Um, so Fran, would you like to share your screen? We can get your, your uh, presentation up. Yeah, sure. Just um, hopefully I go to the right places. <laughs> Had all these lessons from Esther. 
So we want to share the one on the Windows and My Heritage and share and tell me if it's happening. It, it's up. We just need a, there we go. Perfect. You're, okay. You're all, you're all good to go. So take it away. Right. I'm going right back to the beginning and here. So welcome everybody. We covered most of the little welcome notes you had before that I'm on the Sunshine Coast um, and that I like things like footy and um, I'm a conference junkie. But perhaps we'll do some housework first. You might notice here. Now, can you still see that? Yep. Here, can you see that number, Esther, there? Hello? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, that's the slide number. And so if you have a question to a specific so slide, then try and write the number down too, and it'll be much easier. Um, right. So... I use spreadsheets to progress my family history research because they identify gaps, let you focus on your work, lead you to be more efficient, save time and achieve your goals sooner. So I'm going to give some examples from my research, but you should be able to adapt, adapt the methodology to your own research. But I've even considered, let me do the next slide. All right that some people don't spell like I spell and you want to stay organized with a Z. So excuse me if you think I've made spelling mistakes, but basically you have to adapt my spelling like you have to adapt the methodology to your situation. As I said before, I really love spreadsheets and hardly a day goes by where I'm not playing with five or more of them for work and when I get time for my family history as well. So if you're not a spreadsheet user, some of this might look like a foreign language. But I suggest that you start small, build your knowledge with free online tutorials. In the help tech group that I um, coordinate for our local society, Caloundra Family History, we, if someone asks a question, I say, Google it. And now they all answer back, Google it. So if you get stuck, you enter a simple question into Google because that's how the other people that were stuck entered the question. You might get a few responses you have to reject, but you usually get an answer you like. Okay, so today we're going to talk about spreadsheet alternatives. Before you start your family history project, ways to set up your data, collecting your data for your project, keeping up to date and questions. Okay. Now, basically, if you know about spreadsheets already, you'll know this, but you need to consider, do you want something free or do you want to pay for something? So Google Sheets is free and Apple Numbers is free and Microsoft typically is not free unless you get it with your job and you can still use it for your family history. So talking about Google Spreadsheets, it's available at Google and I've got some little facts here to go over. So basically the pros are it's free, it's easy to share things, you can have real-time collaboration, that means your family can be working on the spreadsheet at the same time you are. It saves as you go for those of us that have lost big Excel spreadsheets because we forgot to save them. And you can access it from any computer anywhere in the world just about. But the cons are it doesn't have some missing Excel advanced features, but I'm not sure how much regression analysis you'd want to do for family history. It can get slower because you're going back and forwards to the net. Um, as you increase your data, and it's cloud-based. So there's advantages such as the collaboration I pointed out before, and there's disadvantages. If you're a bit of a panic about deciding if you want your stuff up in the cloud, perhaps you put no living people on your um, spreadsheet if you're going to use Google. Um, the next one, this is just a dump off my own Excel. You can get it from all sorts of stores. It's a Microsoft product. They do have a subscription, which I personally don't like because you're, then you're forking out money all the time. And I, so I look for one-off payments, but that's just something to watch out for. Sometimes it's bundled in with other packages like Office, Word, that type of thing. So the advantages are 
that it's got its advanced functionality, it's fast and responsive. I put in this Z to be shared, fair, you can see customizable. I thought I should talk both languages. Um, it's got lots of formulas and functions and you don't have to ha know, have the internet. On the con side, it's not easy to set up for collaboration. It can be pricey, depending what your price range is. And it's not always that easy to set up um, accessing to data remotely. Okay, so if I'm a Mac user, so I always put in the Apple one, and that's Apple numbers. It's You can see here, it like most Apple products, it likes to have some pretty things set up. If but you'd have to spend a lot of time working that out, how to do it. And so with Apple, it's free. It's really good for personal and non-commercial use. It's got the typical Apple clean interface. You can only use it, though, on uh, Mac operating systems, and it can start to get a bit slow or crash if you've got a really big data. And if you're used to using tabs, it has tables instead, so it's a little bit different. Right, so we considered using software, but what I'd like to say is that even though I love spreadsheets and the ability to manipulate them and sort the data, it's still okay to use paper if you're not a spreadsheet person, or to use a combination of paper and digital. So I've got a little picture to show you here. This is a spreadsheet that I've been carrying around for a year, and I printed it off my spreadsheet, but I will use it looking for gaps when I'm out waiting for a friend to come having coffee. So I'll pick one of these spaces. That's where I made a boo-boo, where's this white, had to white it out. But I'll pick a space that I haven't found something and try and fill in that gap. And then I'll add data later on. And these ones with numbers, if you can read them, the um, references to me to know where the source information is that I've collected. So you can see then I might write scribbly notes around the outside and it's been folded so much it's dented down the bottom. So by having this spreadsheet with me, I can ensure that I'm not wasting time and I can be setting up, I mean, this one here is for New Zealand archives. And I started collecting New Zealand archives things before they were online, easily to find, by going into archives at New Zealand and flicking through the electoral rolls and taking photos with my camera. But then as more files have come online, I've collected more and more. Anyway, so I'll just tell you about these dark cells. That's where you're not going to find something because that person wasn't old enough to vote at that stage. And this here is where a person might have died. I I'm assuming you can see my mouse because when I'm watching other people, you can see the mouse. Anyway, so, but let's go back because before you start any of these projects, you need to actually review your research goals. You need to set some boundaries. You need to write it down to remember it. And then I'm going to use my research as an example for you. So a family history objective. Now, in my case, I'm looking to find out about my family's migration around a town and to overseas. So I've got English, Scottish and French ancestors. My focus is not going back as far as I can. It is not collecting as many ancestors as I can. It's about finding out where they lived and where they moved over time. So I've set some boundaries for time, which is 1800 to 1914, because in 1914, there was a significant change of my ancestors in New Zealand in that they all started to move out of the town centre in Wellington in this particular project that I'm talking about. But it does vary by family and it varies by the places they're located in, by the county or the country and by your family groupings. So you have to decide these boundaries for yourself. My boundaries won't be appropriate. And then I go off and I collect the supporting data. 
So you need to work out what type of records you might want. And so in this case, I'm looking for records that's got the place included. So it might be a census, and we don't have a census. We do have a census in, in New Zealand and Australia, but they're not available like they are overseas. And in fact, it's census week, I think, next week. So um, we'll be filling in the forms again. And things like vital records are very useful in both Australia and New Zealand because they have lots of content that's useful and most overseas people are quite jealous because you can find out things like where the father and mother were born on a birth certificate, how long they've in the New Zealand case, how long they've been in New Zealand when the child was born. You can find things like um, their jobs and so that can lead to information. So another thing could be you could look up directories, obviously, because it's got an address on it. So then, what can you do with this data? Well, you could write a story, you could write a book, you could do a blog post, you could collect it up for your family tree, you can share it with relatives. And what I've done in one case is to combine maps, facts, stories, comments and images to share, and I'll, I'll share them with my family in New Zealand, for example. So here in Google Maps, and I've just done a screenshot, I did for a course at the University of Tasmania, and it's an interactive piece. And you click on the numbers, you can see in this case, clicked on number one, and it tells you what I found out and why and where. You can zoom in and out, I'll just do another one. You can add pictures, so I found this image here, um, of the houses at the time that my great-grandfather was living in the area. And you can um, just keep adding and make it interesting and you, you've got the map. And you can even put layers of different maps. So that's an example of what you can do. So moving on to the next section. We can look at... I'm going to look at ways to collect your data. But first of all, you need to set it up your set up your data. Now I said earlier that you can use it and write down on a paper, or you can like if you don't want to use a spreadsheet, or you can type it in manually. But it does take a bit of time to set it up. But however, if you really want your research to be more focused and to waste less time, it's best to invest this initial time because your research will have a proper outcome. It's less like doing housework. If you're just collecting and adding and collecting and adding, it's like dusting. Whereas if you've set a goal, you can actually then feel you've achieved something. And so it's something that's shareable. If you just try and tell people a whole lot of statistics or dates or times, you'd soon bore them off. Anyway, also this method, I've got a little note for myself saying that you can research anytime, any place from five minutes to whole days. So how do you collect the data to set up your initial spreadsheet, just to go back to what the slide's about? You can write it in manually, you can type it up, you can... Um, but what's really important is you have to understand your boundaries. So if you specified earlier you're going to conclude certain people, or if you have a really large uh, family tree, you exclude lots of those that you're not focusing on in the project. So I find about 20 to 25 because it fits on one page nicely. Um, is a good size to work on and it makes a project manageable and it makes the story focused on a group, a family group or a place. So you can type it in manually. Now I'm going to show an example of cut and place, but paste, but you have to manipulate the data. So we'll move on to that and then we'll go on to exporting. Now, this is where I trot over to my heritage. And if you click the family tree at the top and you pick one of your family trees, and I've just picked an old one that I've had online for a while from 2017, and you can pick up the data. So you could write in by hand on your bit of paper or type into your spreadsheet, um, William, Ireland, August the 19th, 1744. Now, he's an exceptionally rare person. I've got very few people that are in 1744s, um, but I've only got these ones in because it's connected to a DNA situation. 
Um, and then whether they're deceased or not, but I'm a bit lazy. So I go in and I just copy, zoom down the page to collect as much data as I can and do a cut and paste and paste it into an Excel spreadsheet. Unfortunately, it comes in as a big, long strip all down one, for one column. Um, obviously, I can't zoom down on this, but it goes down for ages. Now, then what you could do is you could copy William Ireland, put him in the name. You can see I've, I've put fields up the top of these columns, filled in these cells of what you're collecting. And then you could put in that he's a direct ancestor of six generations. And then you can move the date. And then you can move. And you can see I'm getting bored already just telling you about it. And if you had even just 400 people and six fields to move, that's 2,400 copy and paste. So me, look for an easier way. But if you're only doing 20 people, you know, and you're learning spreadsheets, it could be a way to do it. So what I do is, you can see I'd put in the William manually. I copied Cornelia's data down to William Kitto. I did a control copy, and then I did a space special, and I did a transpose. So I'll just go through that whole thing again. You pick the person, you select them. You use copy, you click in the cell that you want to put it into, click paste special, and then click transpose. And it changes from vertical to horizontal. Now, that's all right. So I'm doing 20 people. And then me, I still want to find a quicker, better, easier way to do it because I'm not satisfied. So then what I found in investigating this, because I have um, built up my spreadsheets for such a long time, it's not often that I have to set up a new spreadsheet anymore. So I found that my heritage, you may not be aware, has got actually some free genealogy software for syncing with your tree that you can download on your computer. So there's a little download button and you can find this on my heritage. Now. For the Mac version, they gave instructions, a simple explanation, how you actually did it. So I'm assuming they did the same for Windows. And then when you loaded up the software and you opened it up, it asked you to log in. And guess what? Once you've logged in, oh, I should tell you, if you don't have a uh, my heritage subscription. There is different levels, and obviously you get a lot more records if you pay, pay have the paid subscription. But there is an ability to do this and use the limited versions of my heritage. Some features which Esther might be able to tell you better about them, but it's basically your sort of family account website and a bit more. Anyway, so I click log in and wowee, they recognize straight away that I had a tree online and you might have multiple trees. So you select the tree that you want to download and it downloads into the software. Now, in this example, I've got the Kennedy family tree because then I didn't have to cut and cover and paste over live people that's in my family tree from private because of private details. So how do you get this report? You go into reports, export your custom report here, and that gives you a little screen where you can export your spreadsheet on people to your project for your project. That well, they call it a project, but I'm saying it's for my project. And then initially just use all people, do the standard things and click OK. And then what we see is this opened up on my my computer in Excel. Now, it depends how your computer's set up. It might save it. But as you can see, it's already got columns, rows, datas, no cutting and pasting. Now, I do do a data dump every year from my personal software, which I, I actually have my main tree offline on reunion on my Apple. 
And I use places like My Heritage and other sites to, to collect and find more data. And so it's important for me, because I'm sort of getting off the topic here, but you might wonder why I've got this ID over the side. It's important for me to have a unique ID so that I can make sure that I've got um, Francis Kitto, spelt with an I, who's a male, and I've got four of three or four of them, um, that they are the same people. So it's much easier than just looking at the date name because the date might change, although you might change the name. So I need a unique ID for every person, but that's more for people that are really into data. And for those people, I'm just going to say you can go onto the family tree builder and you can set the ID in your tree permanently because otherwise every time you download the data, apparently it resets. Anyway, that's just a little tip to the side for people that are really into sourcing and using data this way. Right. So you've set up a basic spreadsheet. You've got the basics of the name, the birth date, place, where they, when they died, when they married, that type of thing. And so then you need to start collecting some data and filling it in. And then you want to review the pro, go back and review the project that you plan to work on and start filling in the gaps. And the reason why I say go back to the plan is by the time you've set this up, you may have changed your mind, adjusted your plan, forgotten what your plan is. Remember I said to write it down? That's why. So here's sort of an initial one where I've got here, test my heritage data dump. Okay. Now, as you can see, I've got a list of names. In this case, I've kept the gender. I've kept their ID. But I've hidden a whole lot of fields because to me, the birth date's the important thing when I'm talking about, now this is what you'll know, 1841, 51, 61, 71, 81, and so on, which are center, census information. And I'm looking to fill in all these spaces. But Arthur Frank Gibson wasn't old enough to vote or wasn't old enough to be in the census because he was born in eight, about 1872 until 1881. So I'm not going to bother to waste my time looking for those. Mind you, if you find one that is in one of those blocked out squares, it usually means you've got the wrong person or you've made an error with the date or someone may have made a transcription error. Um, there are obviously other things that could have gone wrong, so you need to check them out. It's a nice, clean spreadsheet. So how do I find stuff? Well, I go into My Heritage Discoveries and I look for matches by source. And in this time, I'm looking for match records, not the smart matches. And you get loads of them. And you pick one that you want to work with. Now, I picked in an example in 1871, because I've re researched my tree back a bit more, and I found my a record for my great-grandmother, Elizabeth Clark. So what did my heritage reveal? Um, it was really good. She came up pretty well up the, tr up the choice when I found, looked through. Now you can see here, this is what's in my tree on the left side. On the right side is what my heritage has found in the census record, and you can see that they've actually got the census record here. So you can do a quick scan, and if it's not the right one, you can go away from it. But if you want to review the match, of course, what you do is click review it. I always go and look at the um, image. I can't help myself. doesn't matter how much time I've got or not. I've always got time to look at the image. I just love the images. Now, um, I'm not going to go through the image now, though remember that you need to check and match item by my item. But if you go in and review the match, there's this opportunity to confirm the match. But you want to scan right down the page because there's a lot of data. And what I do is if I find this I'll, and I'm out having coffee, I will put a dot on my tree and confirm it. And then I know later I go back, I found it. And so I know it does exist. I know it exists at my heritage. So if not, you can go down to the bottom and 
reject it. And that means they won't offer you that one again um, in the list of ones that they're offering. But it's important to remember that if you confirm the match, it's not like they add additional events to your tree. It's just adding this document that you can refer and add events to your tree. Okay, so I confirmed it and the match was saved to Elizabeth. And I made, if I made a mistake, I undo it. So if you do want to add something, there's a part up the top towards the right hand side top where it says you can extract additional information to match your tree. And again, I do this manually. You can click it to say add all new facts, but I don't want a new fact writing over something that I've researched and know that it's better and more exact and more perfect and, and I love it more. So I'm not going to show you that process. If you go there, you don't have to tick anything. It's a case of transferring from one side to the other and approving it and you can un undo it. Um, but what I want to keep on spreadsheets. So basically, if you go to the MyHeritage education slash MyHeritage.com or the YouTube channel, or I actually like um, watching Lisa Louise Cook's Genealogy Gems YouTube because she's got some good videos on MyHeritage and Lisa talks to me. So um, I can highly recommend finding out how to do things via those channels. Right, we then go back to the example. Now, in this example, you can see there's dates for some people that's blacked out that I talked about before. And I'm color mad when it comes into Excel. So it's very important when you download something, if it's saved as a comma separated file, you need to save it as an Excel spreadsheet or a numbers sheet. Because if you close this up, even if you save it, you'll lose all those colors. Now, I do things you can see on the side on the people's names. You've got some names that are coloured odd. That's just when I'm working with those people. I'll, I'll, it's easier to find if you can just look up the one you want and zoom across the line easier. So I'll do reminders. These oranges are about the same families in this case. So you can see a person that was in this household changed colour and went into a different household. And again, these numbers are my reference numbers to find this source data on my computer. So they can become quite complicated, but if you do a, a written version on a piece of paper, ticks and dots are good. So let me just check what else I might want to say. Oh, this little arrow at the top here, that's a sort. Sort something that I virtually turn on every spreadsheet that I use. I just, you go to, now let me just click the next one. This is on my Mac version. You can go to the data tab and use the filter. You click in on the right hand side to highlight the whole spreadsheet, or you can highlight a number of columns and turn the filter on. And then these little triangles appear. But I use it so much, I've actually got it on my ribbon. Now, soon you can have a ribbon also. So the things I use most are summing up, going home, saving, undoing, um, filtering, print, where you want to print and your actual hint print. So they're the things I use the most, just a little Excel tip. So it's going more over the spreadsheet. So we'll have a look at another example in tracking my New Zealand family via electoral rolls. And this is a lot of the information that I used, including other things like directories and that to make those maps. Now, Flora Elizabeth Jeffries is my grandmother's half sister. My my great so she's my great grandmother's daughter. Now, she was married twice and, and I come from the second relationship. So these were an older sibling, half sibling to my grandmother. Now, I noticed a gap here in 1925 where I hadn't collected her electoral roll. Now, as you know, different web websites can have the same sources but might have different data sets in terms of they might have the image or they might have the 
be indexed or they might have the index and the image. So I assume when I probably missed it out because it was one that was a bit more complicated to find or there could be a transcription error or something, I didn't find it. So I popped over to my heritage this time as opposed to last time when we looked in discoveries. This time I'm looking in, just go over it. in research and I searched for the New Zealand electoral rolls and I'll just go back here so we found them and then I wrote in Flora, Flora Barnard and then I added a restriction for the year 1925 and so that meant that it limited the data a bit and then as you can see, so it was research that I'm under, looking under here. You can see it's added in this 1925, and look, right at the top, it came up, Palmerston. It's actually Palmerston North, but the electoral, electorate was called Palmerston in the uh, Manawatu Whanganui area. And you can go in and view the record. Now, there was another one here for 1935, but if we go back from my sheet, you can see I've already got the 1935 one. So I don't go rushing off looking at this one because I know I've already got it. Or if I could have marked, for example, that it was a really bad copy because the scanning might have been bad. They may have scanned it out of a different book. I mean, these, these are documents that many printed copies, each one from each each elect place you vote has to have a copy. So they may have had a better copy. So yes, I would go to it if I had on my spreadsheet a special star, go and look at it. Anyway, to go back to the one I'm looking for, 1925. So here, view the record. So we'll go to the next thing. And this is a print off. And you can see she actually lived in the fire station. Her husband was the um, chief fire officer. And so if I'm out, I tick my I can put a dot on my spreadsheet. If I'm at home, I might save it and update my main family tree and tick it off on the paper and put my extra special reference on the um Excel spreadsheet. Okay, so keeping up to date, what have you been working on your tree and not ticking off your spreadsheet? Naughty, naughty. Well, what can you do? My heritage helps with this. What you do is you pop back to your home page, zoom down to your recent activity, look up what you've been doing. And so, for example, I collected some electoral roll stuff for, and it was just a fluke, Esther, it wasn't deliberate that I picked your name. Um, you can see, and I can see here that I've collected some other ones for a Francis Irene Kitto. In this case, I can see it's actually got a little document. And so you can click in the link or click in the document and go back to what you found before and then you can fill in your tree and you can update all your software. So that one's for Esther. And this one here was for Francis Irene Kitto. And this is, um, not, I don't know, you probably can't read anything, but if it's too small on your screen, but we've got Francis Irene at 21 Langs Road, Herbert Cleveland, Eric Kitto, and he's at Randwick Road, and then Ivy Ellis is his wife, and Olwyn Zoe at 21, who happens to be Francis Irene's sister. So you can actually get to see the people that were living in the local electorate area. Right, so to go back to the beginning, too much family history is not enough. So that's just a small sample of what you can do with spreadsheets. You can do things like progress your DNA from your MyHeritage matches, um, which will be a total another area and another whole program. But using a spreadsheet would stop you spinning on the spot and start you making progress with your DNA. So thanks for li listening and it's time for questions. So do you want me to do the closed screen or what do I need to do now, Esther? Um, here we go. We're back. <laughs> um, thank you so much for that, Fran. That was so um, informative. And I see a lot of col column, uh, 
a lot of comments, sorry, here um, of viewers who said, oh, they, I hadn't thought of that, or that was a good tip. I never, that, ne that had never occurred to me. So a lot, a lot of really great info here. Um, and I, I see some questions, so we'll, we'll take a few from the audience if yep. that's okay. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so Elizabeth asks, um, she says, I guess this is more of a general question to both of us. Uh, she says, I have a subscription. Where do I find the tree builder? Family tree okay. builder. If I think you just need to put in my heritage slash and then FTB and it redirects to where you are. But um, I could just try, but I'm frightened that I'll cut, cut myself off. So we'll, put, I do. we'll put a link in the column in the in the comment section um, for Family Tree Builder. But uh, but or you could just search online My Heritage uh, Family Tree Builder software and you'll and you'll find the link to download it, Elizabeth. So. I'm not, not saying that people need to redo their whole tree, but if they don't have one, it's an option. But if they want to download data, it's a way of doing it for your MyHeritage data that's easier if, if you're up to that skill level. Other than that, tick on a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Uh, Liat asks, is there a way to tell Excel to mark an irrelevant year for each person or do we have to do it manually? Um, I use formulas and um, special formatting, the conditional formatting. It means that you've got to have the date in the right format. The only thing is sometimes if you're only dealing with 25 people, it's easier just to look at each one separately and think about it. And the reason why I say that is say something like the electoral rolls in New Zealand, you had to be 21. Then at a certain stage, you had to be, you could, you know, they lowered the age. And then if they change it again, I think it's about 18 now, you can't use the same formula all the way down. So sometimes it's better just to think about what you're doing, because if you make a mistake, you'll miss something out. But if it's big volumes of data. I always use some sort of formula. Um, I always, I have formulas on my spreadsheets from years that I've forgotten how I even worked out. One the other day, I got this pink square and I had to try and figure out why it suddenly turned pink. Check the <laughs> formula. Amazing. It's such a valuable tool, just really helps, um, you know, complement our, our family history research using a different program. So, just so useful. Uh, Joanne wrote, she actually wrote a comment and she said, using the record and smart matches to assist in finding out information is invaluable. Um, although a lot is just a starting point, it definitely allows for better research effort. Yes, you do have to look at the things. You shouldn't just go tick and flick. Okay, let's see. We have a question here, another question here from Liat. Uh, she said, I would love to know how I can add a picture, a picture and or a PDF to a column in an Excel file. Oh, you can. There's picture capabilities, but if you start manipulating data, often it's sitting on the surface. And so, for example, I get spreadsheets for work that they have put pictures of the wallpaper. But if I try and move something and say, for example, change the size of the rows because I want to see more data, the pictures are all overlapping. So Excel isn't really built for doing a lot of image stuff. It's more about manipulating numbers and data, adding things up, working out stuff for your accounts. But you can you can literally import pictures and do what I said before, Google it. How do I put a picture into my Excel? But it's like it's sitting on the surface, really. It's not really in that cell. Okay, Kathy has a question. She asks, are there any problems if you only select one column to sort? Does it keep all the other information in line or only sort that column and it mixes up the information from the other columns? Um, so, I think Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yep. I, I know what she's talking about. You can sort one column. Um, if you pick only one column to sort, Typically, you will get a warning message, do you want to sort the other columns? So you're usually saved. But one of the reasons that you, um, I often click the whole sheet 
when I turn on the filter is to make sure that I get as many as I can collected in and if it's a really important sheet I'll save as I go I often save versions as I go if I'm doing something really bad and um, on the Mac it's command Z so I assume it's control Z for undo I get to do that a few times a day as well <laughs> you've got a backup or if you've saved an extra spreadsheet then um, the main thing is trying to figure out which was the one that you actually changed <laughs> it's, it's just important to know Definitely that backing up is is key, mm. and that way that way we have uh, better uh, more versions just in case you mess anything up or you make a mistake. Yeah, so we'll mess up the other columns if the other columns aren't included. And to give you an example, I load the wallpaper people books up there in Excel spreadsheet where there is um, it probably goes to about. You know how you go A, B, C on the columns? Well, it probably goes to about A, Z. You know, it's like two alphabets of numbers. And I accidentally didn't highlight all the spreadsheets and loaded it up. And so the wrong pictures were connected to the wallpaper, the wrong prices, because oh, I didn't wow. notice I'd done that. And it was easier to go and redo it than to um, try and fix each one manually because there was about 80 wallpapers in that book. Wow. Okay, uh, we have a question here from Larry. He asks, can I transfer the family tree to an Excel sheet so I can easily modify the size and change the format? With the family tree maker, uh, um, family tree builder, do you think that's what he's talking about? I'm not sure if he means that or he means in general. Um, Larry, if you're um, still here, please leave us a comment and let us know maybe more specifics um, of, of what you mean, but um, currently family trees are, are um, transferred from one program to another in GEDCOM files. Mm. And, and not that's an not, file. not, yeah, and that's not good for Excel. You'd have to manipulate a lot of data and it'd take ages to try and figure out and find it and that. That's why I found this way of using the family tree builder. Yes, once you get it in, you can change the formats if this helps answer your question. Um, add, like I do, add colours, change the font colours, um, move stuff around. So when I export it, it's not necessarily in the order that I want it. I will delete columns or add columns. Um, I often add two spreadsheets together. So I'll export one and use my ID numbers to match people up and notice where I've got gaps. And then I use this uh, function exact equals exact this cell and that cell. And so I don't look at 400 numbers of dates. I look at it exact and it says false and I know I've got three that are odd. So, um, We'll just take one last question from Marsha. Marsha asks, is there a copy of the spreadsheet headings that you use available? Say that again, sorry. Is there a copy of the spreadsheet headings that you use available? Um, well, I haven't really done one because my main thing with the thing is you have to think about your projects. So on the base data, I have name and I'll, I'll, it depends. Like sometimes I'll have first names and then surnames in one field. Then I might have last name in another field and I might have the full name in one field. It depends what I feel like. So I might add a column in to talk about, Larry said before, about um, how, can you modify data and things? Well, yes, I do. Then what I do is ones across the top, for example, if I'm looking for New Zealand electoral rolls, I'll look at the dates that they happen to be. If I'm looking for um, directories, I might just have one, two, three, four, five directories. You know, I wouldn't necessarily, it changes every time. So um, I don't know if giving you something would really help because you shouldn't go away and collect what I collect. You need to collect what you want to collect for your project. So obviously for electoral rolls, it's easy to put the dates. Um, if you're going to do births, deaths and marriages, well, you'd put the date, the place. I would always split um, because of Excel, there's number problems. So I would split to day, month and year 
in three separate columns, but then I might have a uh, birth dash death date. So it becomes dash death if you've only got the death one. Um, don't know if that answers enough. Oh, look, I have to say this, Carmel, my friend Carmel, she says you can add a hyperlink to the image or a PDF file on your computer. So if you're using the person that asked before about can you put a picture in, that Carmel suggestion is a really good idea that you don't actually put the picture in the spreadsheet but put a hyperlink to it so it clicks open. Oh, excellent suggestion. Um, so now we'll give away the complete plan to one lucky winner in our audience. So thank you everyone who wrote to tell us how you enjoy my heritage tools and features and which one is your favorite. Um, and our winner today is Maureen Trotter. Congratulations, Maureen. And Maureen wrote to us and said, the chromosome browser and the auto clusters tool are both wonderful so helpful in sorting and grouping matches into workable clusters. So congratulations, Maureen, and we'll be in touch with you through private message to claim your prize. Um, thank you so much, Fran, for joining us today. That's all right. For this lovely presentation. We really appreciate it. Now I can turn my lights off because it's like <laughs> so dark here and it's 10 to 12 so I can go to bed. Thank you everybody for turning up, just wonderful. And I'll try and have a look tomorrow, depends how much work because I didn't do much work today, <laughs> worrying about this, see if there's any other questions that I can answer and help and I'm sure Esther's team will probably have a little look too if there's something. If you could put the link in for the um, family builder software, family tree builder software. Of course. Be good. of course. Thank you to all of you for tuning in from near and from far all over the world. Um, and if you're in Australia, have a good night. Bye, everyone. Bye.